So as the last topic of this uh, multi-output modeling, we will then consider how the stoned estimation can extend to the multiple output setting. So let me briefly summarize some, some take-home messages from our previous uh, lessons. So uh, in economics, it's very common to then apply usual uh, single output production function and I try to then model joint production as a parallel processes of, of uh, single output uh, production. But uh, these attempts, these attempts uh, necessarily have to assume away any synergies. And in my mind, this is a really big limitation because, uh, because well, if there's no synergies, why would you produce jointly rather than specialize in a, in a single output? It seems that specialization would seem like a more, more rational choice in, in if there's not really benefit of, uh, of benefit of synergies to do joint production rather than specialized production. Uh, then we discussed the DEA approach and we found that uh, DEA can easily handle uh, convex output sets and therefore synergies. DEA was also quite convenient for bad outputs. But of course, we didn't discuss it explicitly, but we remember from the lesson number two, for example, that uh, DEA is quite sensitive to noise. Well, SFA is of course this typical parametric uh, modeling uh, solution to dealing with noise in the in the regression based setting but uh, i have very serious problems with the multiple outputs uh, applications of the parametric uh, distance functions uh, particularly from the axiomatic point of view that uh, that there's no guarantee that the output sets are even bounded uh, and uh, i showed that uh, that necessarily the either free disposability or convexity must be must be always um, violated so with some parametrization for the for the translock, it's possible to have convex uh, technologies, but uh, then it comes at the cost of the free disposability. And uh, free disposability is of course like uh, very important. For example, in the context of the energy regulation, that you want to have, for example, uh, monotonicity for your cost function. That if if you can have a uh, if you can reward uh, companies for producing less rather than more, then it's kind of bad from the incentives uh, point of view. So with these observations, uh, uh, I think there is clearly a need for better tools, uh, not just in the in the mainstream economics, but also in this uh, in this uh, literature of uh, productivity and efficiency analysis. And I would think uh, that also this would be like. Uh, really an opportunity for, for this efficiency analysis literature and production theory to, to actually develop something better than is currently available in, in uh, mainstream economics. So let me operate in this, uh, this lesson then in the general case of the directional distance function. So remember that this uh, direction vector G is just some kind of uh, some kind of vector that we used uh, earlier to, to project the uh, observations uh, with which we evaluate and we, we project them to the frontier in certain 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 direction and so far we left the direction a little bit uh, a little bit vague so so what 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 is actually the the direction so in this lesson we take a little bit different stance to this uh, this question of the direction so I will discuss this uh, recent work with uh, Andrew Johnson that we published in the uh, European Journal of Operational Research. So uh, in that paper, we, we actually then take this uh, uh, direction vector as an explicit characteristics of the, of the uh, data generating process. So this is a kind of very different data generating process that has been considered in uh, any paper that we are aware of in the literature. So. Let's think of it in, in terms of this, this kind of diagram. So let's start from this kind of uh, point on the frontier, which we indicate as uh, X asteric, Y asteric. So ultimately, of course, uh, uh, every observed data point is on the frontier unless there's inefficiency uh, or noise. So this is this kind of uh, um, idea of denoising that I have also, also talked about during the, during the course. So, Ultimately, if we can eliminate all inefficiency and noise, we can get these kind of observations that are on the frontier. So in that sense, this kind of uh, 
X asteric, Y asteric, we can think about that as some kind of denoised uh, version of our, our observed data point. And then we have this uh, uh, X, I, Y, I. So this is just then this uh, perturbed version of this uh, point on the frontier. And now we introduce this uh, uh, direction vectors G of X and y, G of Y to, to um, make this kind of perturbation. So we multiply this direction vector by epsilon. So with this way, we then uh, uh, introduce inefficiency and noise to each and every input variable and output variable. So this epsilon, it could be symmetric, it could be just noise, but it can also have some, some inefficiency. And therefore we have this kind of target points, what we call target points is x-asteric, y-asteric. And by construction, the value of the distance function is equal to zero for those target points. Okay. So this, this kind of um, uh, data, generate, data generation process might seem somehow somehow counterintuitive to those who have, uh, are used to kind of measuring the distance uh, from the observed point to the frontier, but in some sense we have uh, reversed here the role of the direction vector. So rather than measure distance from the frontier, we start from the frontier and then we have this kind of directional data generating process to, to get our observed data. And of course, then what's the meaning of the direction vector here? The direction vector would then indicate that uh, to what extent each input and output variable is subject to inefficiency and noise. So we have this kind of uh, a univariate uh, random variable epsilon that represents this inefficiency and noise. And then that is transformed to this uh, multiple inputs and multiple outputs using this uh, direction vectors G. So then we can show theoretically if this uh, data are generated according to this kind of directional data generating process, then in fact the value of the directional distance function in a given point x i y i is equal to the composite error term epsilon i. So I don't know if this is something very intuitive or is it difficult to to understand, but um, in some sense this is very common common thing with this parametric approach is to, to uh, distance function. So remember, I, I mentioned in the context of this uh, Perelman and Santini's uh, uh, formulation of the output distance function that uh, in usually in, the, in this uh, parametric estimation, we think about this uh, logarithm of the, of the distance function as the composite error term. And uh, in this sense, this our result is, is uh, completely in analog with this uh, usual approach in the, in the parametric literature. Uh, however, I find it also somewhat counterintuitive that, uh, that uh, we have a, have a distance function and uh, in our setting there's nothing random or stochastic about the distance function. So remember that these uh, distance functions are like production function. They are completely deterministic uh, representations of the technology. And there's nothing random about the technology here. So technology is just what it is. So it is this uh, production technology, production possibility set T, and then this distance function just measures distance to the, to the boundary of the production possibility set T. So there is nothing random or probabilistic about this, uh, this, um, this uh, directional distance function. So at least to me, it was really counterintuitive that how can such kind of uh, uh, completely deterministic uh, technology distance function suddenly become a random variable. To understand where is this, then we need to recall this uh, data generating process. And this is why I think it's very important to even conceptually to have this kind of uh, formal description of the data generating process. So this really highlights the fact that actually our observed data these, uh, these uh, xi and yi. So remember that this xi and yi were perturbed by this, uh, this uh, random uh, composite error term epsilon in certain direction. So the fact that this kind of deterministic distance function becomes a random variable is due to the fact that our 
observe data, this x i and y are subject to the inefficiency and noise. So this x x and y are random variables, and therefore the value of this kind of perfectly deterministic distance function uh, becomes a random variable because this data that we put inside this function are random variables. So this is why I think this proposition is very important that it characterizes how this kind of uh, deterministic technology and deterministic distance function relative to the technology becomes a random variable. It's because this, our data are perturbed by inefficiency and noise. So we can utilize then also this result. It's not only for, of, the, of like uh, some theoretical interest, we can practically utilize it also to develop a, a non-parametric regression model. And uh, we have also examined other properties of the, of the distance function and um, there exist certain kind of kind of st structure and normalizations uh, that are possible. So we utilize the properties of the distance function in our paper to move one of the variables to the left hand side of the equation and then move this uh, uh, random epsilon to the right hand side of the equation, like I discussed already in the context of the parametric output distance function. So this is in practice how it would look like. And uh, to do that, we have divided the, the output, output, uh, first output variable with the corresponding element of the direction vector. So, so g of y uh, sub, subscript uh, 1. So that's the first element of the, of the direction vector corresponding to the, to the first output variable. And we have also normalized these other uh, other inputs and outputs accordingly. So we have this kind of uh, uh, x, uh, an arrow on top of this vector x and, and also arrow on top of the y vector that indicates that we have made this kind of uh, uh, transformation to our input and output variables to, to match with this kind of, uh, kind of normalization. This allows us to move uh, uh, this output variable number one to the left hand side and keep other variables as part of the, as part of this uh, distance function, and then move also this uh, co composite error term epsilon to the right hand side of the equation. At this point, I want to, uh, I want to also emphasize that uh, I have chosen to take this first output variable, but it could be equally well output number two or output number three or any of the input variables. It doesn't really matter for the for the results, so we can verify that. Results do not change if we choose some other other variable. It's mainly for the just an innocent normalization that we need for the for the regression formulation. Uh, another important result that I want to emphasize also that uh, that uh, if this kind of data generating process is true, then uh, we do not have any kind of endogeneity problem. Uh, we can show that this composite error term doesn't correlate with this. Uh, renormalized uh, input vector and renormalized uh, output vector. So, so there is not really any kind of uh, uh, endogeneity problem. And I would argue that this is particularly important if we had actually some kind of parametric uh, linear regression uh, formulation of the distance function. Uh, in the non-parametric convex regression, in fact, this kind of result is uh, stronger than required. So, so even if that was not the case, then, then uh, then uh, we do not necessarily have the endogeneity problem in convex regression. However, the endogeneity problem in convex regression is not really uh, well understood at this moment. So, so uh, it's good to have this kind of stronger than stronger result than necessary. So, to formulate this kind of kind of uh, CNLS uh, uh, problem, then we can have this kind of renormalized. Uh, uh, output number one on the left hand side and renormalized x and y data on the on the right hand side of the equation. So this would be just the usual kind of convex regression formulation, except now we have also an additional constraint. Uh, so it is the third constraint uh, which concerns these um, coefficients uh, beta and gamma. So betas are like usual, they are this uh, uh, shadow prices for inputs, so the marginal products of inputs, 
And now I have parameters, gamma for those output variables other than output number one. And then we need to have this kind of normalization to make sure that we have the, the directional distance function in the specific direction uh, that we have specified. So, so that's, that's these kind of beta and gamma multipliers need to be normalized to satisfy that kind of condition. There's also an equivalent formulation that we have done in this uh, uh, book chapter that I have also referred to in, a, in a several points earlier. So notice that uh, it's also equivalent to formulate it without specifying the uh, output number one as the dependent variable. So, so in general, we could have actually all of the output variables on the left hand side of the equation and proceed as, as we have done earlier, but now just then use these gammas as the, as the output weights. So I hope that <clears throat> this kind of formulation can also shed light that actually there's nothing, nothing particular in the choice of the output number one as the, as the dependent variable. We mainly just did it to show that this usual kind of um, CNLS formulation still continues to apply. So we do not need to uh, prove consistency of the CNLS again, for example, because this is just a just an, um, minor extension of the, of the classical uh, convex regression setting to include multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And the directional distance function is just uh, imposed by making this kind of uh, normalization of this coefficients gamma and coefficient beta with respect to the input vector. In fact, this third constraint uh, imposes so-called translation, um, translation condition of the directional distance function. So this kind of condition must always apply in order to estimate the directional distance function. So let me illustrate then also this uh, application of the multiple output formulation in the context of the electricity distribution firms. So in the previous examples, we considered this uh, regulation period number three from uh, 2012 to 2015. But in the latest regulation periods that we are also currently living in, uh, the regulation has been based on the general multiple inputs, multiple output setting. So on the input side, uh, we have distinguished between the variable inputs, which was this controllable operational expenditure. And then we also take uh, into account the fixed input, uh, namely the capital stock. And uh, we do not need to aggregate then this, uh, these capital expenditures to the total cost, but uh, because that would require that we take some kind of, uh, uh, we need to move this uh, capital stock to some yearly flow variable. So what is the capital expenditure? So we can avoid that kind of step when we, when we model uh, multiple outputs, uh, uh, sorry, multiple inputs in this way. The output variables are the same as we had in this previous example. Uh, except we also have a, this undesirable output that we mentioned. So we have these outages uh, measured as an, an output variable. And in fact, this is actually a not really cost to the companies, but it's actually cost to the customers. So there is some hedonic estimation of the damage costs, uh, uh, which, which is used then as the measure of the outages. So that captures the uh, number of outages and the duration of outages and, and such kind of factors. And then we also had this uh, uh, connection points per use points as the, as the contextual variable. And um, we have then done this uh, estimation in multiple steps like, like usually. So we started with the uh, convex regression of the directional thing, the distance function like, uh, like I described earlier. Then based on the CNLS residuals, we applied this uh, kernel density estimator of Hall and CMAR and to identify the, the um, need for the frontier shift. So then in step three, we do not uh, just shift in parallel the frontier in one dimension, but we actually shift it in the, in the direction of the directional distance function. And uh, ultimately we do not really need any kind of, uh, um, we do not need any kind of uh, JLMS uh, estimation of the inefficiency term, but rather in step four, we, we compute the shadow prices of the, of the frontier. So what are the, in some sense, the DEA multiplier weights? 
And, uh, and indeed, we use DEA in step four to estimate these multiplier weights for the efficient uh, points. So these steps one, two, and three, we are essentially denoising our data using convex regression and, uh, and this uh, kernel density estimation. In step four, we use DEA to estimate the shadow prices. And then given those shadow prices, what we actually do is then, then we have applied some um, an Excel spreadsheet program that the, that the companies can use and the regulator can use for computing what is the efficient level of uh, controllable operational expenditure conditional on capital stock and output variables and, and uh, interruptions and, uh, and the Z variable. So in that sense, in this, uh, this uh, regulation application, uh, we do not need actually the efficiency scores, but rather we need uh, where is the where is the frontier, and particularly where is the variable cost. And in the in the latest works, where we have also then examined also the more from the strategic perspective that okay, what is the uh, what is the rationale for doing this kind of benchmarking? And uh, I complete this presentation by briefly discussing the idea of a conditional yardstick competition. So here, here we have the, the input space. So think about this kind of setting with two inputs, variable input and fixed input, like in this previous example. And suppose that there is some kind of uh, substitution possibilities between inputs, uh, fixed inputs and uh, variable inputs, as illustrated by this, uh, this input isoquant, which is this curved, curved line. And uh, the idea here is to illustrate that if we, if we use the total expenditure norm like we had in the third regulation period, or we, if we do just operational expenditure, then we end up in a different point on the, on the input isoquant. And the idea with the conditional yardstick is that once we estimate this uh, uh, input isoquant in the multiple input, multiple output setting, then um, we do not necessarily need to project the firms to this uh, same direction vector that we used for estimating the input isoquant, but rather we can then then use the uh, use this kind of idea that uh, okay in the short term perhaps this uh, capital stock is fixed, and the only possibility for the firms is to adjust their variable input. So along with that line, then in the conditional yardstick competition, the companies need to then take this kind of efficient level of variable input and compete in terms of that taking the, the capital stock as, as fixed. So that is illustrated by this, uh, this horizontal movement in this conditional yardstick. So if we would use the, the total expenditure norm, then it would assume in this example that, that the company would actually need to decrease its capital stock. But if, if the capital is, is difficult to adjust in the short term, or if it is even fixed in the short term, then that may be, may be impossible. So, so uh, therefore, in this conditional yardstick, then this capital stock is uh, taken as given, and then the operational expenditure is adjusted accordingly. Uh, this is also different from just simply taking this kind of uh, operational expenditure as, uh, as, and ignoring the capital stock, because then this OPEX norm that is sometimes used would then uh, lead to very high value of, uh, of, the, of the fixed input when this... Uh, when this uh, capital stock is completely ignored, then, then you would end up to this kind of situation that, uh, that companies would have strong invest, uh, or strong incentive to over-invest in capital because the frontier wouldn't really take that into account. So by taking, taking the capital stock also into account in the, in the, and using this kind of two-dimensional input vector, we also have, have some protection against the over-investment because Capital is just taking as fixed, so then you cannot adjust it also. So that illustrates, in my view, the, the, really the power of the uh, modeling of, of multiple inputs and multiple outputs in the real-world context. Uh, and it is possible to uh, take into account uh, this kind of curvature conditions like, uh, like uh, um, convex input sets and convex output sets uh, in an in a axiomatic setting also taking into account random noise in the estimation. So, uh, so uh, in my mind, uh, this kind of uh, uh, semi-non-parametric setting is, is uh, far superior to this kind of uh, parametric approach that fails to have this uh, 
for example, monotonicity of the input isoquants and output isoquants, and uh, deterministic methods that uh, assume away noise. So I would say there's not really any other technique that can can so can be so flexible to take into account bad outputs, uh, shape constraints, uh, um, random noise in the data, and even panel data, and and so on and so on. So that completes the, the discussion of this theme. As uh, further extensions, uh, I've also noted that uh, we focused here into this um, uh, directional distance function setting. So extending the stoned approach to the classic radial uh, output distance function and input distance function still remains an, an uh, open question. So there is some, some progress in the paper by Schaefer and Claremont uh, few years ago. However, I do not think that their solution is uh, entirely correct because uh, in their, their approach, the choice of the output variable to the, to the left-hand side uh, would actually influence the result. And uh, I have actually developed a solution to this problem, but it's, it's, uh, uh, I haven't really published it yet because it's a bit uh, technical and, uh, and I have been kind of waiting that the that the literature would first catch up, that they would, uh, they would also understand and uh, appreciate the solution. So, so far I keep it as a private information. Yeah, so as the next topic, uh, then we move to the intertemporal setting of uh, productivity growth. So we will look at the measure of uh, measure productivity growth, also using some uh, classic index number techniques, and I also briefly connect to the to the growth accounting approaches, and then we also utilize these frontier estimation techniques to decompose this uh, productivity growth to the components of uh, technical change and efficiency change and, and similar. 